When NASA's space shuttle was designed as a reusable vehicle more than 30 years ago, the spacecraft was not the only part of the high-tech recyclable system. The twin solid rocket boosters that help power the shuttle's ascent to space have been refurbished and used multiple times during the shuttle program. But to do that, they had to be retrieved from the Atlantic Ocean after each launch. After burnout, the spent boosters tumble earthward for about 45 miles before parachuting the final few miles to the water. The job of retrieving these 149-foot-long boosters has fallen to an elite team of divers aboard the NASA vessels Liberty Star and Freedom Star. These ships were designed specifically for the task of booster recovery. Each ship carries a crew of 10 and an additional 10-member dive team. About 24 hours before each launch, the two ships set out to sea from Port Canaveral on Florida's east coast to be stationed near the zone where the boosters will fall. We will plan to arrive on station about four hours before launch, and we have to get there before that so that we can clear the area. There's a, a, a box that we have to keep clear of ships that's uh, close to the impact area. But the divers go to work long before the retrieval even begins. Prior to launch, we will have all of the dive gear ready, all of our camera gear ready, all of the retrieval equipment ready to go. The booster recovery is unlike any other diving job. The divers operate the cranes, they operate the small boats, they operate the reels. Well, they're the diver medics that operate the recompression chamber. You know, they fill the tanks, lead the dives, they do the diving. I mean, it's everybody's doing everything. From their vantage point in the Atlantic, the team is able to spot the boosters after they fall away from the ascending shuttle, and that's when they spring into action. We are not allowed in until after it's cleared. So the boosters land, and we could be anywhere from 10 to 20 miles away from the boosters. It can take us about an hour to get to the boosters from where we are. Before beginning the retrieval process, the team conducts a complete visual inspection. Using still and video photography, imagery of any areas of concern can be sent back to shore for analysis. Once the inspection is complete, the divers begin the recovery. First recovered are the parachutes, which are also recycled for future flights. Then the frustum and drogue chutes are recovered and brought on board the ships. So the next operation would be to launch the diver-operated plug, which is about 1,400 pounds. So it's not unusual for us to have seven divers on, on that dive to put the plug in. So we dive it down, attach an inch and a half airline to that, and start blowing air into the booster. That forces the water out of the booster, and the booster rises up out of the water and falls over on its side. We attach uh, an inch and a half steel cable once it's it dewatered and proceed to tow it back to port. The highly practiced procedure doesn't always go as planned with the ships and divers up against weather and sea conditions. So the, the roughest mission was probably STS-63. The conditions were so bad that the boosters were badly damaged, the um, nozzles were broken loose, the, the forward skirts were damaged, and in fact, one of them fell off on the way back in. The conditions were so bad that for many, many days, we couldn't even attempt a recovery. These skilled teams of divers aboard the Freedom Star and Liberty Star completed their last booster recovery following the launch of Atlantis on the STS-135 mission as the space shuttle program draws to a close. What might have been on their minds during that final dive? And you're so busy doing the job and you know, trying to make sure that, that the job is done correctly and that everybody gets home safely, that you don't really have time to think about what those feelings are. That'll come later. <laughs>